Hey guys, uh, sorry I'm missing conference today. I'm at Virginia Mason doing orientation. Um, I felt this would be the easiest way to go over my presentation. Um, I just have my PowerPoint. I'll do a voiceover so <laughs> you guys can have the distinct pleasure of watching this for the next, I don't know, 15 or 30 minutes, and then go over some questions together. Uh, the auricular reconstruction is mainly from two chapters in Bailey's. Um, it's where I stole most of my pictures from. Um, on otoplasty and congenital abnormalities. And then the microsha stuff is just taken from Kathy's chapter in Cummings. Um, so most importantly, you know the anatomy of the ear. Um, hopefully most of this is a review, but uh, let's make sure we all know where the triangular fossa is, that we understand what the anti-helix is, the superior and inferior crus that we understand what the scaphoid fossa is, um, and that we understand that this is the concha, obviously, but the concha simba is uh, superior to the helical root. Um, and you just remember Cinda, simba from Lion King is superior, and then the concha cavum is inferior. When we think about the vascular supply of the ear, the arterial supply originates from the external carotid artery mainly the superficial temporal and posterior auricular arteries with some minor contribution from the occipital arteries. Um, the neuro supply of the ear, I must say, over different figures is not 100% consistent, especially when we're looking at the concha bowl. Um, but we can use um, this figure here to, to the best of our knowledge, I guess. Things that are going to be pretty consistent is the greater auricular nerve. No, this is from um, cervical rootlet C2 and C3. We experience this in neck dissections and in facelifts, and if you injure this, um, patients will complain of their lobules being insensate, difficulty putting in earrings. The uh, lesser occipital nerve is going to cover the superior aspect of your helix, and uh, this is also from rootlet C2 and C3. Um, the Tragus and kind of the facial portion should be pretty obvious. Um, this is the auriculotemporal branch of cranial nerve 5. Um, when I've seen a few questions on this. They ask about the innervation of the concha. So part of the concha, the inferior aspect, is innervated by um, 10, whereas the kind of area just outside the ear canal is innervated by seven from the nervous intermedius. Uh, the green branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve is the middle ear, so you can ignore that for now. When we're thinking about otoplasty, it's important to know the ideal positions. Um, these obviously vary a little bit, but I would just remember the ear is about three centimeters wide and about six centimeters tall. Um, for protruding ears, you need to know these numbers, that the ear is about 20 to 35 degrees um, off the skull. And then if you measure it, it's about one and a half to two centimeters. Um, we know from our microtia work, the ear is about 90% developed by the time you're five or six years old. The embryology of the ear, again, is something that is uh, pretty variable. If you look at figure eight, and if you um, look at different sources, the places each of the hillocks end up is quite variable. So I took this figure from Dr. Dukert's book. I figured we could probably trust him the most, um, and that's what we'll follow for this talk. So the first brachial arch gives you hillocks 1 through 3. The second brachial arch gives you hillocks 4 through 6. And the development of the ear starts at 6 weeks and is largely completed by 8 weeks. I would say, instead of remembering what all of these hillocks are, just remember it. the first is the tragus, the last, or six, is the antitragus, and two through five are somewhere in between. And I would um, imagine you could probably figure this out from uh, the question stem. So uh, let's look at some odd-looking ears. So most of this you're going to see in Peds Clinic. If a kid comes in with a pointy ear, we call it a stall ear, also known as a Spock ear. We believe that um, 
this is from an abnormal transverse cruise. So think about the antihelix coming into an inferior and superior cruise. You can see that the superior cruise in this picture is not well formed. Um, we don't know what the causes are. Obviously, there's things like in utero forces or some abnormal course of the intrinsic ear muscles. The treatment, if you catch it in the first few weeks of life, is going to be molding um, or later on surgical treatment. Cryptosha is this little hidden pocket of an ear. Some believe this is caused by an abnormal attachment of the superior auricular muscle to the scapha rather than to the triangular fossa. I don't know if this is a wide held belief, but um, this is what Bailey's discussed. The treatment for this, again, if you catch it really early, you can do ear molding, but this is the first few weeks of life. Um, otherwise, you can be repaired with surgery. And the surgery, as you would imagine, would just be some sort of skin graft in the back to lift the ear back up. Uh, the constricted ear. Um, when they discuss this, it it's not super specific. They talk about mild, moderate, and severe, quote unquote, restricted ears. If you think about a lop ear, that's going to be just a folded over helix. Whereas a cup ear, if you look at it from the side, looks like a C. And it's a much more severe deformity. Um, if it's a mild constricted ear, then molding in the first few weeks of life is going to be what you want. If it's a moderate constricted ear, small surgeries like V2Y advancement flaps. And if it's a severely constricted ear falling into the range of, you know, microtia type ears, then you would need a big surgery. So auricular reconstruction of costal cartilage. And then the prominent ear. Um, there are several theories on what caused a prominent ear. Probably the most well known is the lack of the antihelical fold. There's also some discussion about the depth of the contour bowl, um, and the repairs are based on what the belief mechanism is. Um, there may be some differences in insertion of the distal muscles of the antitrichus muscle. Um, which I'm sure we all know exactly where that is. So let's just remember quick when we're looking at the prominent ears what our ideals are. If you remember, it's uh, six centimeters by three centimeters our ideal size, and we should be about two centimeters off the skull or somewhere between 20 and 35 degrees. Uh, so when you're repairing the ear, it's important to keep these numbers in mind. The techniques that you're going to want to know off the top of your head is this Mustard sutures. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen this at Children's. It's pretty straightforward that you place three horizontal mattress sutures um, in the auricular cartilage through a post-auricular incision. What they're not showing you is the other side of the ear, where it's important to understand that these sutures do not go through the skin um, on the anterior aspect of the ear. What they do is they create a fold in the cartilage there's lots of techniques described, whether you resect cartilage to assist with a fold or score it. I don't think most of that is very important um, for your general knowledge. It's just knowing that the mustard are these mattress sutures that recreate the antihelical fold for protruding ear. Copley does talk about the Stenstrom technique, um, which to the best of what I can understand is just scoring the cartilage before you put the sutures in. Um, the age of which to do this, um, I wouldn't say is consistently agreed upon. The paper that Copley wanted us to review does say that it is safe to perform uh, otoplasty with these type of techniques in children less than four years old, and the um, repair is robust. Again, I don't know exactly when Kathy does just the straight up otoplasties, but I would imagine it's probably somewhere between four and six years old. The microtia, uh, just a quick review of microtia. The grading, as you recall, is pretty crude. So microtia one is a constricted ear with minimal tissue deficits. So it looks like a pretty normal ear, just small. Microtia two is the absence of major portion of the ear. So this actually involves the severe cup ears we were discussing earlier with the quote unquote constricted ear. Microtia three is the peanut ear, which is markedly deformed with only a small remnant of cartilage. And, um, then there's anosia, which means the absence of ear. This picture comes from Dr. C's chapter in Cummings. Um, as do these photos, I stole them all from her chapter, so she should get all the credit for them. Um, they, um, 
They want us to discuss a little about the brunt technique. Um, but basically, I just went over what Kathy does. So her, her thing is that kids should be over six years old. Um, it's important to know the um, timing for the atresia repair. And from Kathy's standpoint, this should occur after the microtia repair. She uses a Nagata technique now. She used to use a brunt technique. <coughs> the Nagata technique is a two-stage. So for those of you who have not worked with uh, Kathy yet, the first stage is harvesting the costal cartilage. This is important to know. It's the sixth and seventh nerve, the synchondrosis, plus the floating eighth nerve. So you see right here, this is the synchondrosis. This is a floating eighth. So this synchondrosis is carved into the base plate that you see here, and then the floating is uh, carved into the helix. These are sutured together. There's lots of techniques to use wires and whatnot, but Kathy uses sutures. And then this piece right here is to um, recreate the tragus. This is at the end of the first stage, um, um, and you see the lobule uh, is transposed to a nearly anatomic position. After the first stage, um, the second stage is pretty straightforward. It's just the elevation of the ear, as you see here, and the creation of a postauricular sulcus. So this is where the split thickness can graft from the groin is placed there. Um, so uh, they want us to discuss ER consults and how uh, you would manage um, auricular trauma. So the first one is a partial avulsion. I'm not sure how many of you have dealt with this, um, but basically you can deepithelialize what um, what you have and put it underneath the skin pocket. This was popularized by this Maldic in 1971 called the pocket technique. Um, and you kind of have to use your imagination for the variety of what your defect would be. Um, if, there, if the ear is still attached, then we usually just sew it back on because um, it, it's pretty amazing how they'll survive. But say you have a complete avulsion of the ear, then um, you can use this technique for the partial avulsion, and so you can de-epithelialize the entire uh, cartilage, and you can put it in a skin pocket. And um, in the post, you can try your best to put it in this uh, posterior pocket, so that when you do further stages to lift up the ear, that it's in a, um, an anatomic position. This was described in Maldic, 1971. Um, a little bit more uh, sophisticated is this Baudet. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name properly, but in 1972, that idea was just to deepithelialize the posterior cartilage and put some fenestrations in the cartilage to um, assist with blood supply. And so that's what this picture is of here. So you deep the posterior portion and then you just suture it back where it belongs. You make a skin flap um, so that your suture line is this hash line here. Obviously, this would require some. Um, additional surgeries to lift the ear up and skin graft the posterior aspect uh, after it's developed an appropriate blood supply. I haven't seen this specific technique used, but the photos in the paper they reviewed really didn't look great. <laughs> and so in 1980, this guy, or Gail Pennington, um, did describe the first micro reimplantation of the ear. Um, this is described with and without venous anastomosis. Sometimes they just use the arterial anastomosis. Obviously, if they don't do a venous anastomosis, you have to put leeches or something in the ear to uh, provide appropriate drainage. And the benefits is that this is an approved cosmetic result. It should give it to you in one stage, and it preserves all your recon options. You don't burn too many bridges. Um, the Risk is obviously you need special techniques to be able to do microvascular surgery. The vessels in the ear are very, very small and it's a bit finicky. So you want a short ischemia time. They didn't specifically um, designate what the time would be, but I would probably think, you know, in the four to six hour range and the ear should be stored properly. So in a paper towel and um, on ice. 